want to remind members, when I stand, the member's speech is over. Mr Speaker. Uh, I call Maya Lubeck. Tēnā koe, te manga o te whare. Um, I don't know where to start. First of all, I would like to say, um, on this second reading of the Employment Relations Amendment Bill, that um, Jackie Dean thanked the National Party, I think, two or three times for this what she called wonderful economy. I'd like to say thank you, working people of New Zealand. Thank you for this economy. It's not one party that makes an economy great. It's the working people. And that despite the uh, employment legislation they have had to work under for years. Now, this, this bill actually tackles many of the undermining changes made by previous national governments that made it much harder for working people to get ahead. And I know that the member for the Coromandel called this a 1970s piece of legislation. Other members have said, get into the 21st century. And then they describe a very adversarial environment of, of, of companies and workers and unions. And that just shows how much out of touch they are with uh, modern workplaces. They don't realise that in many instances, the very well-performing companies of New Zealand, like the, the Fonterra, Air New Zealand, Kiwi Rail, they all work very collaboratively with unions and in fact they promote and they encourage their workers to join the unions when they first start working for them. Um, now no mention has been made by the other party of the object of the Employment um, Relations Act which is to address and acknowledge uh, the inherent imbalance in the um, power in the working relationship. And over the years, it has completely gone out of whack. And this is what this bill is doing. It is the first step in righting a lot of these wrongs. Now, the National Party has been going on about these, these earth-shattering changes uh, to this bill. But, but let's look what they actually do. Um, we are reinstoring um, the duty to conclude bargaining. That was removed in 2015. We are reintroducing um, the fact that uh, employers cannot make uh, pay deductions for partial strike. 2015, we're reinstating, God forbid, the requirements around rest breaks and meal breaks. 2015, 19-day trial was only in, um, in, instated in 2000 and, um, 2010. So Mr Goldsmith had something to say about the... Um, the right to strike, but the right to strike is actually a, a, an internationally recognised right that is not just uh, something that people want to do um, because they feel like it. This bill is about workplaces that will provide good jobs, decent working conditions and fair pay, and it's restoring some of the basic human rights of workers to be treated with fair, fairness and dignity. Um, the changes that I just referred to from 2015, many of the changes only go back a couple of years. They were actually made against advice of the Ministry of Business, Innovation and Employment, against advice from industrial relations practitioners and unions, and also they were contrary to New Zealand's international commitments. Um, one of them, for example, is the removal of rights of new workers to be covered by the terms and conditions of an existing collective agreement for the first 30 days of membership. And if I look at the then comment from the Minister of Labour, actually said that the changes will enable employers to offer individual terms and conditions that are less than those in collective agreements. So that was all of those changes were meant to do. They were trying to prey on the more vulnerable, drive down terms and conditions, all that um, for, for um, more flexibility or like we uh, call it exploitation. There was another one, uh, the 30 day rule um, advice was that it would disadvantage young people, uh, those exiting benefits um, for employment and also it would uh, disadvantage other vulnerable workers but national, at the time national government chose to ignore that advice um, and, and we know the effects of it. Now. The member for the Coromandel says that under this bill, nobody will be better off. Yet we've heard real stories, as our member Gentinetti spoke about earlier, from people that have been hurt by the last government's attacks on their working rights, on their lives and incomes. All that, what we heard from the other side, is to create record amount of jobs. But what kind of jobs are they? Um, you know, insecure, part-time, 
Um, the member for Northcote said it, flexibility, you know, who wants to be in a job for such a long time? Well, actually, a lot of these people hold two or three jobs to make ends meet. And it's pretty tough when you want to make sure that you provide for your family and perhaps also have a little bit of time uh, to spend with them. And it, it, it just shows us that the national government at the time was absolutely out of touch with um, what working people needed and what collective bargaining does, because collective bargaining lifts wages and conditions, and it does so not just for union members, it actually does it across the board. So um, when people are saying uh, those bad unions and there's only so few union members, I think uh, the member of the Coromandel mentioned 18 per cent, well actually it's the people that are not with unions that are missing out. If you look at the collective agreements that are negotiated by unions, there's only one per cent of all those members that missed out on the pay increase, but if you look at people on an individual agreement, 45 per cent missed out on a pay increase. So said for those not with unions because they are the ones that actually are missing out more than the others. Um, we know uh, it pays to be with a union and, and because the collective bargaining, strengthening of union rights in the workplace will ultimately benefit um, most workers. So fairness and balance in the workplace is what seems the National Party not agreeing on. Um, Gentinetti mentioned the fact that a lot of good employers are not afraid of these changes because not only do they already respect and value their work, workforce, um, they also know that what the current legislation enables bad employers to do is undermine them. And when, you under, uh, when you're a good employer, you're trying to make um, you know, a fair and decent work environment for your workers, and there's someone uh, around the corner who doesn't respect those rights for the same workers, you're actually up against a very unfair competitive environment. Good businesses will also treat their employees right, uh, their union delegates right, um, and they recognise that union delegates actually fulfil a really important role in the workplace. They help resolve workplace issues before they become larger problems. And, and I guess the constant narrative from the other side about how bad um, unions or union delegates are shows them that they actually have no idea about modern workplaces and how everybody can win when people work together. Uh, the unions, in fact, uh, warned the national government at the time, back in 2010 and 2015, that this bill would be bad for workers as well as for employers. And it is exactly what has happened. Um, someone mentioned the uh, reinstatement. Uh, I think it was uh, Nicola Willis. Um, now, I have also spoken to um, um, early childhood um, places that had some issues with that, because they had completely the wrong idea about reinstatement as the primary remedy. It is for an unjustifiable dismissal. So if somebody should not have lost their job in the first place, they get reinstated to the place they were in before. Now there's a lot of hurdles still to, um, to consider. If, uh, for example, a workplace cannot practically have that person back, then that person does not get their job back. But at the end of the day, if you're dismissed and it wasn't your fault, then you should get your job back. And I don't understand why that is such a, a, a big thing to, um, to consider for the other, for the other side. Um, the other one is the, is the MECAs. Uh, now, there seems to be a really uh, unclear message about MECAs. MECAs are not a one-size-fits-all. If you look at uh, MECAs that are used by, um, by, by big businesses, for example, we had um, Chris Flett from the Dairy Workers Union explain to us how it works at Fonterra, um, and Jill Ovens for Air2 about the DHB workers. They actually explain to us about the schedules in the Meccas, and sometimes those schedules are larger than the Mecca themselves. So, uh, once again, the narrative about it being one size um, fits all is not right. Um, there's also insufficient understanding about the excess provisions. Now, it's not an unfettered excess, and we had an organiser from Together actually made that point really well. She said, think of, of, of me as an organiser, um, as a contractor. If there is a health and safety induction requirement, then as a union uh, official, as a contractor, that's what we do. We report in, we sign in. So it's, that's exactly what it is. It's not just walking in and, and doing whatever you like. But once again, this excess is just going back to the way things were previously. Um, on the 90 days, there has been no evidence at all, because we've asked the officials, there's been no evidence of extra job creation for the 90 days. But, you know, if, um, but when it comes to flexibility and the smaller businesses, that has remained. But when it comes to young people, um, someone from Stand Up told us actually, the 90-day trials 
teach us as young people that we are disposable. And someone said the 90-day trial caused an endless sense of anxiety. Um, and that's the sort of uh, comments that we've heard from working people and how this old law has affected them. So for all those reasons, Mr. Speaker, I um, applaud this bill and I commend it to the House. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, I call Dan Bidwa. Mr. Speaker, this bill is payback for labor.